came about, the conveners of this for, for some years have been uh, putting together sessions in the hydrology uh, section, hydrology science section, on earth observations and remote sensing. And so this year, we proposed to do a union session that would be uh, more visionary than, than, and more focus on vision than on actual missions and what's going on. And so that led to the evolution of this uh, session. We have three speakers today. Uh, my name is Eric Wood. For those who don't know you, uh, one of the conveners. We have three uh, speakers today, um, and I think you'll agree that they sort of span um, the visionary uh, part. Uh, one is uh, on um, petascale uh, design using tools to look at uh, observation systems in uh, more complicated ways. This is uh, uh, Pat Reed. There's one on uh, um, the future of looking at uh, space gravity missions, uh, and then one on uh, very high resolution Earth observations and looking at the water cycle. So the first speaker, uh, which we, uh, is Patrick Reed, who's an associate professor of uh, civil engineering, civil environmental engineering at, U at Penn State University. Pat has, uh, is coming to this problem by looking at adaptive observation design and, and, and looking at adaptive observation design led him to develop a number of multi-objective uh, decision support tools. And it's using these tools to try and understand how you would put together um, space observation assets that he's going to um, talk about today. So, uh, Pat, uh, thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, so first, uh, I want to acknowledge this is some of the things that you're seeing are uh, the consequence of a seven-year collaboration with the Aerospace Corporation, particularly um, Matt Farringer and Tim Thompson. Uh, in recent, this petascale, uh, ambition, I should say. It, we've been working with uh, Eric Wood, and some of the demonstration and the tools that you'll be seeing were developed by my former PhD and current research associate, Josh Collat. So just to start with framing the problem, uh, and many of you probably don't even know what the phrase petascale means, but since about 2005 to about 2020, the United States is going to spend about a billion dollars on what they call leadership class computing. And so this is this next generation of computing. And when they report why they're going to spend this money from the earth science perspective, this is the figure that they use. So they show the community climate system model. And the example that they show is the instantaneous net ecosystem exchange. Here where you have in green and white, you have where sun activated net ecosystem exchange. And here in red, you have the respiring areas where it's dark. Now, the purpose here is not to go into detail of CCSM, but the higher ambition is what they're interested in is the coevolution of ecosystems and human systems in the next generation of tools. So what are the next generation of tools? So I'll define a few things if you're less familiar with some of the computing. So this is that leadership class computing. So over the last decade, and this goes back, the example would be the Texas supercomputer Ranger, uh, built in 2008, was the fastest supercomputer in the world at that time. It was a Terra scale. So that means it does 10 to the 12 calculations per second computer. And it has 60,000 cores. So that's the order of the Terra scale. And to give you a reference point, uh, this rate of calculation is about equivalent to the human brain. And as we move past that, what they're currently building, uh, the Blue Waters at the University of Illinois, it's a $300 million supercomputer, about 300,000 core. And that, in addition to the Jaguar system at Oak Ridge, represent the petascale. And what they're already proposing is the exascale. 
moving forward to where you go from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of cores. And to tell you the rate of change in the technology, a single chip expected to be developed by NVIDIA, the Echelon, is expected to have terascale performance in less than eight years. So you'll get a supercomputer on one chip. And that's how things evolve. So the question is, what does this mean? What does this investment in supercomputing mean for Earth observation? And so one of my points in this talk is the focus on Earth science prediction needs a commensurate focus on space-based observation systems. And one of the things that we're recommending as part of this initiative is the concept of an observation system simulation events where we actually start to bridge the astrodynamical design all the way down to the endpoint science, which isn't being done. Part of doing that is that there needs to be new mathematical frameworks to bridge the disparate objectives and focus and priorities of this kind of design process. And so what I'll demonstrate for you is some of the tools that we've developed in my group that are being used operationally in space systems design, where you balance many time-evolving objectives. Uh, and you use this in a combination of massively, massively parallel search, simulation, and visualization. So this is from the DOE report on leadership computing. And this gives a summary of what they feel is the focus of why they're building large systems from the Earth system's perspective. And as you can see, the shift from weather to climate down to where the present focus is, is they want to better resolve the water cycle. And they want to bring that into co-evolving human or social systems. And so what you have here is the co-evolution of ecosystems, human systems in the water cycle. Now what does this mean? So what I showed you on the prior slide is the transition from Terra to Exascale is a 10 to the 6 increase in computing. For them to uh, do this, address the co-evolution, here are specific things that they want to focus on in terms of the fidelity of their models through resolution, adding process and process parameterizations, longer duration. All of this adds to a 10 to the 12 to 10 to the, you know, well, 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 12 increase in computational requirements. So still, even despite the investment, this problem is moving beyond even the exascale. But one thing that seems to be missing from the justification is the commensurate investment and design of the observation system, so the Earth observation system. And one of the things here in a simple schematic is just to show the different potential components. And this is an opportunity. This can blend a broad range of different types of fields and expertise into this particular issue. So when we have a space-based observation system, you have a constellation. And Current constellations are often a network of constellations, so you're coordinating across multiple assets. What we need to do is focus on our ability to build sensor slash orbit simulators where we can understand or clearly get some sense of what the simulated observations are going to be from that system. And there are many people working in this area. Then this gives us the opportunity to go through the process that's normally done in using the satellite information in terms of the retrieval algorithms, the land surface data assimilation, also thinking about how the terrestrial observation system itself needs to evolve in this process, and what characteristics we need to better characterize the form. But the purpose here is that this largely, this candidate constellation problem is done in absence to some degree from the remaining steps. And even in that constellation design, you have long-term or life cycle issues. So you're typically investing hundreds of millions to potentially billions of dollars in this. And the cycle of life of these kinds of systems, you have the initial buildup, so the initial design specification, how the system's going to work. Then you move into after it's actually operational. You may have to reconfigure the system to expand life, or there might be unexpected problems where you're trying to recover mission. And then ultimately, you may have to replenish it if this goes into long-term planning, so long-term design of Earth observation systems. That being said, it's not just a dynamic planning problem from the orbital space. It's dynamic in terms of how we need to adjust our 
terrestrial observations, our monitoring systems, and our prediction systems. There needs to be feedback in this process. So coming back to do this, thinking about this a little more formally, the science of observation. So what we need to do is we need to be thinking about how we invest. So what are the costs associated with these missions? But we also need to be thinking about how we can bridge the two areas. There is a long history in complex systems engineering. And that's where you get into things like satellite constellation design. And there's also a large body of work in Earth science. And the potential to do this observation system simulation experiments is a bridge between these two worlds. And where you build feedbacks between observation and prediction. As we gain new technological observations, you're going to feed into your scientific hypotheses, knowledge, and potentially your ability to predict. Your ability to predict then can enhance your ability to control or manage systems. This also can feed back to science. Doing this in a far more formal way, where you actually account for the formal objectives in this and the feedbacks in this system, non-trivial, and I think a unique opportunity for the future. One of the challenges in doing that is what is the priority? What is it that we want to do? And so this goes back a ways, but I like this quote on the challenge of the information problem and designing observation systems. So Marshall Moss frames this very well, I think, in stating that there needs to be a more integrated measure of information that results from both a complex interaction of the hydrologic knowledge that is gained as well as the procedures, ultimately, where that knowledge is employed in real-world problems. So I've been referring to that as end-use science, but that could also be end-use application. And at present, you get the satellites that you get, but there is not a direct feedback from the end-use all the way up. And that's not just the Earth system science where that's true. So this is really a call for linking observation, prediction, and management. So one of the proposals uh, from my group is that this concept of Pareto efficiency, if we generalize this concept, it's a way that we can actually seek to, to address Moss's call for an integrated measure. And so if you're not familiar with this, this is just a simple, this could be any sensor system. As you add more sensors in this system, you're reducing the error of what you're doing. And what we're interested in is that we want the absolute minimum error for a given level of investment. If you go in anywhere in the blue box, you do worse in both, and there's no reason to have that. Likewise, different regions. So this entire region, the blue region, is dominated, and what you're interested in is this optimal trade-off. And so cost-benefit analysis has been around for a long time, and it's not necessarily anything new or shocking because you do diminishing returns, a small investment, a large gain. Continued investment, a small marginal gain. What's different, though, is classical planning has, until recently, largely focused on single objective problems. So a single metric of coverage subject to cost constraints or some of the others. And to some extent, you can think of that as a magic dart. Did you get the constraints right? Did you get the problem formulation right? Are you abstracting people's priorities correctly? Do you have the diverse views captured? Because when you add another objective, it turns out that often that single objective that you optimize maps to an inferior point if someone has more information available to them. As you add more objectives, there's more knowledge, more hypotheses, and more potential exploration in the problem. And this is an example of moving from a two objective all the way up to a four objective problem that I'll use to illustrate a few things. What's interesting in just a few notes here is you're looking at four objectives, but this is the same add a sensor problem. You're getting the decay and uncertainty and error of your investment. You have that, but this implicitly has all the single objective all the two objective, all the three objective combinations in it. So you can look at different subspaces of this problem. What does that mean? You have different perspectives. You could have an earth science objective. You could have an astrodynamics objective. You could have a state objective based on precipitation. You could have a state objective based on soil moisture. It adds the dimensionality in the design. The other side of this is compromise. 
Because in any of these large investments, you're not going to have agreement as to what are the priorities and where things are. And this is actually an example from one of our papers where one of the criticisms of formal network design or observation system design is, yeah, it's elegant and useless. Because ultimately, you don't capture anything that I'm interested in. And this is one of the examples. So red in this diagram means I don't care, I don't like it, and I'm not interested in it. These are the two most common formulations for an observation network design problem that were in the literature. They either did a single objective version or a two objective version, but they didn't consider both. But when you go to a higher dimension and you discover what's in between these, you actually see a compromise between the two objective trade-offs. So it's a trade-off between the trade-offs at higher dimension, and then you actually discover something that's usable or interesting, and this has kind of been one of the primary premises behind the work, is that you facilitate decision-making and discovery. This isn't necessarily just about a systems analyst telling you what you have to do. It's about facilitating hypothesis generation, improving the science, and the end-use management of what you're doing. Now, the ability to solve these kinds of problems, they're very, it's not trivial, it's extremely difficult, and it's extremely computationally demanding. And so what you're actually seeing is a movie of our algorithm solving a three-objective problem. In red is a three-objective analytic function. So this is that Pareto optimal front. That's what we're trying to get. What you see in blue is the algorithm actually translating space, and it's two different things. In terms of an optimization problem, it's a little bit different than what a lot of people are used to. You have to translate to get to a higher metric of value, but you have to distribute across the surface to facilitate decision support. And one of the things about this, this actually connects to the cognitive systems literature, because I'm giving a maximally diverse representation of trade-offs. And you can use that to generate your hypotheses and get a sense of performance. So when we move through this, this is actually being used operationally. Uh, this is actually a summative slide in the process of this. So I've been working with aerospace, and they've worked with a variety of federal programs to implement this process. And Part of this, I mean, there are each of these steps. So we've created interfaces to the optimization to make it connect to a lot of different types of planning software. And we also have the supercomputing and then the end-use visualization. But one thing not to discount is this stakeholder interview part. You have large stakeholders, large perspectives, large investments, and you cycle through this particular process. So one thing, as a leap of faith, it's a little bit easier to see than it is to explain. So what you're seeing here is the actual evolution of a GPS constellation moving in the space. And as that evolution proceeds, you're dramatically increasing several of four objectives. Now, we can speed this along in terms of the example to what you get at the end. What's different here than traditional ways of looking at these problems is that we can interrogate this. This isn't a static figure. This isn't something that we can't look at. And if we're interested in this, we can look at the different design spaces of this problem. And so we can animate this in the context of the observations that you're looking at and compare what you're at. Now, in terms of a vision of the future for Earth observation, this is where it ends. There's no connection to the actual end-use science here, but there could be. The states of the system, the projected observations that you get, the associated uncertainties, the fidelity, all of these things could feed forward into the overall design interrogating them and answering them. And you can look at it from a variety of perspectives. And this is where it supports the scientific hypothesis generation, the fidelity of the design, and the overall quality of the experience. And there's something to this. In the prior slide, I used two words, discovery and negotiation. And I mean discovery in a literal sense. This is for a GPS configuration to where 
what happens if space debris takes out a plane of satellites? So we lose three out of 24 satellites. How do we reconfigure? And so in this application with my collaborators at aerospace, the things that they looked at is they want to minimize the number of satellites that they move to reconfigure mission. They want to minimize how much fuel they use because this is the long-term life of the system. They want to maximally cover, so get back coverage missions, and they want to minimize the time to recovery. Now this example that was published had a couple of stark results. One, if you did a typical analysis where you focus in on just coverage, which is this is the best coverage solution, green is bad here. It's a dramatic use of fuel and the lifetime and the long-term performance of this system is degraded. So you got your performance, but you've lost the life. This allows you to have this compromise solution where you still have a sustained life and you get some sense of your recovered mission in this. One of the more interesting things is that this design as proposed here actually is very different than the rule of thumb that's been used for 30 years. What they would typically do is they'd go to the plane where you had the loss of satellites and then you'd reestablish symmetry in that plane and then you would move forward. That turns out to not only not be the right answer, that may degrade the system. And so this is a, an actual example of where a long-term design rule or perspective uh, is falsified through this discovery process. And so in this, this has been used in a variety of programs. And one of the things just here is that it, it's not uncommon, actually, for these rules that have been around at the decade time scale to actually be reinterpreted when you think in broader terms in your design process. And my point in this slide when we come back to the water cycle is that <laughs> astrodynamics and the end use science are largely independent at this point, and I think there is a broad mode of potential discovery that we could exploit. If we go further to, this is just a hypothetical exploration of the global precipitation mission. And so you have multiple partner assets, and you're looking at how should we do this. So what you're looking at on the axes is basically your average revisit time, and then your worst case revisit time, and you get a trade-off between these two. And what you're looking at in color is how many satellites are added in the system. And it shouldn't be shocking for folks that are familiar with it, you get a dramatic gain when you add one asset, and so you're working with two satellites. And so this is largely the, reflects the decision of what's being done. Now, in this particular instance, we are focusing on this problem in this pilot, and we implemented it on the TAC Ranger system. And we focused on trying to maximize what we can do in a day. And to put this in context, what does this mean, this efficiency? It means we can do 16,000 times more in a 24-hour period. So that means that I can do 50 years of work in one day. What happens if I move to the petascale? I can do 500 years of work in one day. If I go to the exascale, I can do on the order of about 3,000 years of work in one day, and it's that evolution exploration. And the other thing is this facilitates not just the optimization. One of the other things that we're looking at is incorporating sensitivity and control and looking for dominant processes in this. So uh, some challenges from both perspectives. Right now, one of the motivating factors, what I showed you was for fairly simplified astrodynamics. And one of the things that aerospace is interested in and others is accounting for perturbations like geopotential solar radiation pressure, third body effects. One of the thoughts of that is that they can make missions more cost effective and expand the life of the system using these perturbations as a means of passive control. Now on the other side is that obviously different times, locations, states have different levels of importance. And if you feed back that up as an objective into the actual design, that can affect the configuration that you're going to be interested in. Just as an example, these are actual timings on the GPM mission. So what I showed you was a very simplified oblate earth analytic analysis. So interpreting these uh, tables 
As you move down in the rows, you're increasing in fidelity. This is at max resolution, and at this resolution, you're adding in perturbations into the orbital assumptions. And so the net take-home point is as you account for this from the astrodynamics and improve the fidelity of that, you have a dramatic increase. And this grows linearly with the number of satellites in your constellation. So th the take-home points of that is just increasing or accounting for these and seeking that passive control to extend the life of your mission is a 10 to the 3 increase in computational requirements. You put on top of that the search and optimization, you have another potential 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 6 amount of computation. And so that's one of the reasons why we're exploring the leadership class computing. From the Earth system's perspective, so one of the things that we need to consider is how would we integrate the Earth science, and particularly the water cycle science, into this design? And it's from a mini objective perspective. If we think about this, and we use state-of-the-art assimilation technologies that have to be designed very carefully, and the example that I give here is the ensemble multi-scale filtering. There are multiple reasons why I would consider these types of things. One, it's parallelizable. Two, it preserves key properties in your system. It moves across the different scales and types of data, including ground all the way up to satellite information. And you can formulate objectives in terms of the fidelity of things. You can do error attribution, maybe at large river basins. There's a variety of ways that you could calculate the states expected from your simulation looking at the value of that, the potential uncertainties, and bringing that back up into the orbital design. So one of the consequences of how you would attack this, and I think it's less uh, common in this particular area of our sciences, but in the complex engineered systems, it's fairly common to think about subsystem breakdowns and how you would do this. And if we have these multiple objectives, the earth science objectives, the trajectory objectives, all of these things, in the future of these kinds of computing platforms, you can have these objectives working. Remember when I showed you that example of the four objective problem? It had in it all of the one objective, all the two objective, all the three objective problems implicitly. But you can use that to decouple the, the system. One of the more interesting things is to think about the controls and the dependencies in the systems. And so that's one of the new areas that we're working on, is as we solve these problems, looking at the hierarchy, so the probabilistic hierarchies of your different sampling decisions. And just to in give you an interpretation of this, even if you have this simple terrestrial network, and it's just one yes or no of adding observations into the system, you have a strong codependence. And so what this graphic shows you is a rule that basically 99% of the time, each of these rules, green means sample a location, red means don't, these are your dependent locations in the center where they're dependent on these decisions out here. These rules have to be satisfied for you to get a Pareto optimal solution. What's the take home point? From a mathematical perspective, this is a very hard problem. This is harder than the classical knapsack problems in the operations research literature because you have this high level of dependency and that should make sense. Our states are strongly correlated and organized in space and time. And part of this is as you make an investment across space and time, the purpose is to get a sense of those dependencies. As you add objectives, as you add management, drought or flood, the dependency network would change and understanding that dependency would be very valuable. So, to summarize, key points here is Pareto efficiency is this integrated information measure, and I think it has a lot of merit for the next generation of Earth observation, and it's actually being used operationally for several satellite constellations. Bridging the astrodynamics and the end-use science objectives, I think, is a potentially transformative investment. And one of the things that we want to discover are the hierarchical dependencies in these systems to the information. You're spending a billion dollars. So you should have some sense of what's that good for and how can we uncover that. 
So in terms of this, transformative capabilities. As the example I gave you, at the Terra scale, you're doing 50 years of work in one day. At the Peta scale, you're doing 500, and then you're at about 3,000 years of work in one day at the Exa scale. And the irony is there's going to be a chip in eight years that does this. So the evolution is we'll all be using supercomputers, whether we acknowledge it or not. So the next thing is thinking about the tractability of the problem and how that changes, particularly if you're thinking about the ambitions of capturing the coevolution of ecosystems, social systems within this, and then bridging that up to the top, the trajectory design and the time variance of this particular problem. And one of the key ways of really understanding the value of the observations themselves and the difficulty of solving this kind of problem is going to be new frameworks where we actually do re discover and respect these dependencies, like the graphic that I showed you. If you don't do that, it's actually going to be extremely difficult to solve these kinds of problems and get a sense of uh, the trade-offs. So with that, that's it for me. Now we have heard about uh, what the future needs for computing will be uh, promising uh, and will be providing us. However, uh, we are here because there is a gravity there, and uh, so we, we would like to know how we can measure gravity. That's one thing. Now there's everybody dealing with the mass movements, so mass cons conservation is uh, obviously not very important that we, we need to know. So with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Nico Snell. Um, uh, Nico has got his uh, PhD in the University of Munich uh, in geodesy, and uh, he was uh, assistant professor in the University of Calgary. He got his uh, Master of Science in Geodetic Engineering from Technical University of Delft. Uh, he has been involved in all the major uh, uh, space gravity missions, the, the CHAMP, the GRACE, and the GOSI. And we would like to hear from him what the future will bring us. Please, Nico. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bob. Um, Spaceborne gravimetry, novel tool for continental scale storage chains monitoring. That's uh, indeed the title of my presentation. But I'd like to be a little bit broader and, and, and tell you in general a few more things of what I think that geodesy can bring to hydrology. Now. Now, geodesy has perhaps uh, been a little bit tangential to uh, hydrology uh, over the last, uh, well, perhaps for the uh, last uh, decades. But I, I think uh, the points of contact where we really have to work together, uh, those points of contact are getting more and more. Nevertheless, I want to give you a very, very brief introduction to geodesy for those hydrologists that are not so comfortable with uh, talking to geodesists. So geodesy is really a very, very old science. The, the word geodesy itself was already used by Aristotle. Um, the old Greeks knew about the spherical shape of the Earth. That's, by the way, more or less our business, the business of geodesy, determining the shape of the Earth. And the old Greeks already knew uh, shape must be spherical, not only for me uh, meta metaphysical reasons, uh, as m many people think. No, they really did observations. And one of them who did observation was Eratosthenes. He de de determined the cir circumference of the Earth. Then, for a long period of time, nothing really happened. Uh, uh, throughout the Middle Ages, uh, nothing happened in, in terms of geodesy. Uh, after the Middle Ages, uh, things accelerated, actually. Uh, Snell, uh, you know Snell's law of refraction. Uh, Snell did a lot of surveying, a lot of geodesy, actually. And he wanted to determine also the shape of the Earth. He, he called himself the, the Dutch Eratosth Eratosthenes. Uh, and he did determine that with new technology. 
but as I say, things accelerated then, especially theoretically. Uh, there was a huge, huge debate, which was one of the most, let's say, the hottest topics of the, of the scientific day at the time between uh, the French school and the English school, uh, English school led by Newton, but also influenced by people like Huygens, uh, French school by Descartes, and both of them came to the conclusion, yeah, the Earth is not a sphere, it should be an ellipsoid. But they couldn't agree which direction the ellipsoid was going, either oblate, uh, either oblate or prolate. Uh, and actually, uh, interestingly enough, it was a French man, Maupertuis, who, decided this discussion by doing measurements up in Lapland. Uh, actually, although he was in the French, uh, he was in the French team, more or less, the, his, his conclusion was, yeah, Newton was right. Uh, things accelerated more because doing these, all these measurements to determine the shape of the Earth, people noticed, well, actually, ellips ellipsoid is not a good model either. Uh, the real shape of the Earth is, well, the real physical shape of the Earth is more like a potato. It's, uh, they, they, later on in the 19th century, they, they would call it a, a geoid. But this is, let's say, the physical shape of the Earth, the, more or less the equipotential surface of the Earth, in, in gra gravitational equipotential surface. So that was uh, more or less 18th, 19th century. And measurements got better, and measurements got better. And then people, of course, found out, well, actually, this geoid is perhaps not too good either. It, it, it should be time variable. Uh, fundamentally, the Earth is changing over time, in all time, at all time scales, by the way. Uh, uh, seasonal, daily, uh, decadal, and so on, and so on. So that's the state where we're in now. And because we're monitoring these time variations of the geoid by space techniques, we can say a few things about hydrology. So what can we do uh, from a geodetic viewpoint uh, uh, about hydrology from space? Well. Area, determining area by optical microwave uh, or microwave method, that, that's, that's a given uh, that has been done for a long time. Uh, monitoring height or elevation by altimetry, well, that has been done for quite a while already, but perhaps not so much mainstream in hydrology yet because it's too coarse and then time resolution not good enough. I'll, I'll say a few words about that. Elevation change by INSAR techniques, mass change, that's, that's one of the key points of my presentation here mass change can be determined by gravitational sensing. So that's really a remote sensing technique, but not, of course, in, in, in optical terms. It, it's gravitational remote sensing. And that can be done by so-called satellite-to-satellite tracking. Velocity, uh, stream velocity can perhaps be monitored by INSAR, slope uh, perhaps too. Volume in the future maybe by swath alt altimetry or swath interferometry, whatever you want to call it. And I would like to focus a little bit now on, not only on the gravity sensing, as, as is implicated by, 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 my, uh, by the title of this talk, but also on altimetry. And I'll start with altimetry. Altimetry is, is, is a system designed for, a measuring system designed for oceanography. Uh, it's a two-way ranging system, typically radar, although there's also laser altimetry. It's a nadir pointing. It has a footprint, especially the, the radar version, has a footprint of, let's say, roughly 10 kilometers, and it's really designed for oceanography. Only on the ocean you get this type of accuracy, centimeter accuracy. So you send out a pulse from the satellite, you receive it back, and the pulse, uh, the, the waveform looks a little bit like this in an ideal case, and you can, first of all, find out when does the pulse come back, uh, so that is this point here. But you can also determine from the slope, uh, slope of the trailing edge here, or the slope of the, of the uh, leading edge, you can uh, determine the roughness of the sea the, the, and, and, and things like that. Uh, so not only the, the height, but also um, the sea state. Uh, and that's all very well. But if you would like to apply this for hydrological purposes, these ideal returned pulses don't look like that. Here's a, a scenario for... Uh, altimetry over a lake in northwest China. And you see here a series, top to down, and again in the second column the same, a series of, of returned pulses. And you see that, well, at some areas, they do look a little bit like the ideal shape here. So there you have good returns. But if you look, look here in this area, the returns are really poor. So that means this, this centimeter accuracy that you can achieve over ocean cannot be achieved for 
well, this type of purposes, lake or river altimetry. Rather, you are talking about decimeter, perhaps 50 centimeter accuracy. Now, um, nevertheless, it can be used, and it is used for, for hydro hydrology. Uh, here you see, uh, for instance, an NVSAT ground track in the Congo Basin. All, the, all these ground tracks are satellite passes, and sometimes it hits a river where it does get reasonable returns. Although, well, if you look at such uh, one of those individual points, this is how, it, how the satellite flies over the river. And so the question already is, where, where is my point of return? Uh, so you can imagine that, that the accuracy is, is not too good. But nevertheless, people get, get this type of time series um, um, on a regular basis. Now, if you look at this uh, global plot of, of the Topex Poseidon mission, which is another uh, satellite altimetry mission, you perhaps can get, you already have an idea what can be, can, can be done hydrologically with this type of, of, of information. Uh, and especially you get an idea what the limitations are. Because you see here the ground track, which looks a little bit black here, but if, if you would zoom in, of course, you notice there's a big gap between two neighboring ground tracks. Uh, Topex has a repeat ratio of, of 10 days. Uh, so that's about, uh, I believe, some, uh, some 140 uh, revolutions in that period of time. So the, the track spacing is, is basically uh, 40,000 kilometers divided by 140. It's really, really coarse. And the time resolution, as I say, is then about 10 days. So that's pretty limited, I would say. And then given the, 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 the accuracy of several decimeters, you see that, that well, the use for, hyd for hydrology, I would say, is limited. Nevertheless, it, 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 it can be used and it is used in hydrology. Um, so the fundamental observable there is really height, the elevation. As I say, decimeter accuracy, but uh, not the lower decimeter, rather the higher decimeter level. You can determine lakes, reservoirs, floodplains, and, and big, big rivers. The revisit period, well, uh, all these satellite altimeters have their own pattern, but, but typically it's in, in this range, 10, 35 day revisit period. There has been growing and accumulating a lot of experience, so 20 years of experience by now. In the databases uh, of, of such time series that I showed in the database, there are uh, hundreds of targets, and, and with targets I mean hydrological objects like these, and this has become more or less operational. You can download this from websites. The future uh, would be something like this. Instead of this, this, this single nadir pointing measurement, why don't you try to get area? Because combining area and, and elevation, you have volume change, and, and that would be perfect. And that can be done by interfer interferometric techniques. Uh, so this would be swath interferometry, or altimetry, whatever you would like to call it. And you would really get the height variations over, let's say, pixels. These pixels are variable in size, from two meters to 50 meters, you can read here. Um, and every single pixel is not, perhaps not very accurate, uh, perhaps also 50 centimeters. But if this 50 centimeters would be white noise, you can really average out over many pixels, and you really get down to centimeter accuracy. So that would be the future. Uh, and future is, is relatively near future. Maybe people are thinking about a launch in 2016. Um, so again, the fundamental observable here would be height and area, uh, which means volume, or volume change, I should say. Horizontal resolutions of 10 to 100 meters, which means perhaps all lakes, globally, all lakes at, at this, of this size, of this minimal size, could be monitored. All rivers of, of this width could be monitored globally. Um, vertical resolution are indicated already. Uh, by averaging, you may, be, may get down to centimeter level. Slope uh, would be something like this. Time resolution is several days, uh, which depends a little bit on the configuration. Uh, it's not only a single overpass, but because you're looking sideways, you, you can make use of different passes, of course. So a, a faster time resolution. It's an NRC recommended uh, mission. Uh, if it would fly, it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, finalized yet, but if it is going to fly, it's probably going to be a NASA, a, a U.S.-French mission. NASA and CNES, uh, they have a lot of collaboration already over the past uh, decades in, in terms of uh, 
Topax and JSON missions. All right, so that's, uh, that was altimetry. Now, spaceborne gravimetry. Uh, and that is, I think, really something new and, 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 and I would say very interesting for, for hydrology um, because you don't measure height or, or something other uh, geometric thing, but you measure mass. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you have to fly a satellite in space and you have to track its orbit. You, an, an, uh, a mass spring system like this, of course, can never sense mass because it's, it's a free-flying object, uh, you know, uh, you're floating in space, you know, the pictures of the astronauts uh, flying in the space shuttle or so, you're free-flowing, so you wouldn't measure mass directly or gravity directly. No, you can only do it indirectly, for instance, by, by following the path of the, the, the orbit uh, and especially the orbit perturbations of the satellite by tracking to uh, GPS satellites. Well, this by itself is not good enough to, to get mass changes uh, uh, 400 kilometers below you uh, uh, at, 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 the, at a signal level that is necessary for hydrology. Now, you have to do this in, in, in differential mode. So you have, have at least two of those. You have to connect them by, well, not by a spring, of course, by some ranging, uh, ranging device. And then, uh, yeah, see how, how these differential perturbations work out. Uh, so I realize this is a very poor animation, but uh, that's the best I could do here. Uh, this is realized by the US-German uh, mission GRACE, which flies on a circular near polar orbit, uh, 450 kilometers altitude roughly, uh, and, and, and slowly decaying. It has, broadly speaking, a separation between these satellites of 200 kilometers, and it was launched in 2002 with a design mission lifetime of, 2000, of, of five years. And it's still flying, and it's still providing, well, I would say good data. There are some outages now uh, sometimes, and, and the batteries are low, and people are really afraid that tomorrow could be the last day, but still it's flying and, and producing science. Um, it has a microwave link, K-band ranging. Uh, the, the range rate is determined approximately by one micrometer per second. Additionally, it has GPS receivers, so you can also do this, this, this orbit, uh, this, this non-differential orbit tracking uh, through the accelerometers on board and, and star cameras for uh, attitude determination. Now, what can you do with this, especially in hydrological terms? And I would like to start a discussion with this graphic here. And you know, if, if you're at the conference like EGU, you, you, all week long you see nice graphics with a lot of uh, colorful blobs on it, uh, and especially in the earth sciences, you always have the earth with colorful blobs. So you might think, well, this is another color, colorful blob picture again. But I would say this is really interesting. So this is the secular mass changes, secular mass changes over five years of grace. Uh, mass changes from all different kinds of sources, uh, so in order to to convert that to the same level, uh, it's usually translated then in equivalent water height. Unit is millimeter per year. And you're really looking at, at, at yeah, I would say, fantastic uh, geoscience here. Uh, for instance, uh, a Greenland uh, ice cap melting. Uh, also, West Antarctica is melting. So whenever it's blue, mass is lost. Also. Uh, further ice melting, but at smaller scales here in Alaska and Patagonia. There, there you see a few big red blobs, so that's not where ice is accumulating. No, this is where, uh, uh, this is the, the air, these are the areas of, of post-glacial uplift, especially Fennoscandia and, 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 and more than Fennoscandia even. Uh, uh, the Laurentide ice sheet. When, when it melted 80,000 years ago, the earth came up and it's still coming up one centimeter per year, perhaps, here in the center. You see a few more things that is difficult to see, but there was supposed to be a nice edge between blue and, and a little bit of red. And actually, that, that was the area of the, Sunama, uh, the, the, the uh, Sumatra Andaman earthquake, which aliases, of course, an earthquake is not a secular effect. It's, it's a jump but it aliases into this secular plot here. So if you would, if you would model it uh, mathematically by a jump, you would really see it, it's, it pops out. So big earthquake like that can be seen in gravity, as a gravity change. But that is, of course, of no concern to all of you. I, I'd like to focus on, 
on a few other areas, uh, Murray Darling Basin, you see blue, which was a really dry period. Uh, you see there really blue, so that's Ganges uh, Basin depletion probably, and perhaps also uh, Himalaya uh, glacier melt. Uh, Amazon is getting wetter. Uh, Congo doesn't really know what it has to do, either getting wetter or getting drier. Um, also, the, the big uh, tundric uh, catchments in Siberia are getting wetter. So there's really, really a load of science. Now, this is great, but at the same time, you, you can see, well, these are changes from different sources, uh, geophysical or solid earth sources, the hydrological sources, and so on, and they are overlapping. And that is, that is well, perhaps not so good. Um, so atmosphere transports or, or mass transport from all kinds of sources can be monitored. And, uh, and whatever is known in these transports can be modeled out. For instance, atmosphere can be modeled out to a large extent, not perfectly, but to a large extent. Solid Earth is pretty well no known. Uh, uh, hydrological cycle is one of the big unknowns, and ice is one unknown. Oceans are pretty well known again. So, you try to model it out, and what remains is supposed to be hydrological signal plus ice signal. So in this, in perhaps one, one more time. So in, in this animation, you see monthly solution. Every month, such a solution is produced. A gravity field is produced. You put it uh, as a long time series there over a couple of years, and that is, yeah, to the interpretation of a geologist that should, should be uh, mainly hydrological signal plus noise, I must say. You see a lot of noisy things going on. And that's something we really have to work, in, uh, work on and for, for current data, but also if we think of future missions. Uh, but in general, GRACE has demonstrated that it can monitor large-scale hydrological processes, uh, seasonal scale especially, and secular. Here, for instance, one example, the Ganges Plains uh, depletion uh, I mentioned already the, the Murray, uh, Murray uh, Darling Basin drought. Um, you can do a lot of interesting hydrological things with this type of data. Uh, and you can try to, to start uh, looking at your mass balances. Uh, um, for instance, um, mass change in a catchment, perhaps you can use that in your hydrological mass balance or your hydrometeorological mass balance, and that's what we're looking at in, in, in different projects uh, right now. Now, sometimes that works great. Uh, uh, people uh, who give grace uh, presentations always like to use uh, Amazon as an example because it's, it's a huge signal, it's a, it's a huge area, um, so you get nice, nice, nice results, usually. Uh, so here, the, the blue vertical stripes, that's sort of, sort of bandwidth that you could get from, from different types of gray solutions because there are, there are several different types of solutions. But you see that, that in this case, it's a hydrometeorological validation. You see that that, uh, that there's a really, really good match. Of course, if you go to uh, smaller catchments or drier catchments, then, then maybe the, the correlation is not so good. Uh, Grace is, is pretty rough, or pretty coarse, I would say, and it's certainly not perfect, so we really must take a careful look into these things. So, a lot of exciting news, I think, for hydrology, but it's certainly not perfect. One thing I pointed out already, satellite gravimetry is the only remote sensing technique that allows for integrated estimates from the surface down to the deepest aquifers. Uh, um, that's a statement, and that's a statement for satellite gravimetry in hydrology. At the same time, it's a disadvantage, I would say. It, 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 it measures the whole column, uh, top to down, and, and, and yeah, you have to separate out the different uh, f vertical uh, compartments. Um, so that means automatically that that grace will never be the solution to a hydrological question. You always need, of course, other sensors. Now, so the separation is, is one issue. These funny stripes that you just saw in animation is another issue. That, that's typical for a measurement. I mean, the, the, gr the gray satellite flies in the polar, which means north-south orbit. Two satellites behind each other, so that is also north-south oriented. 
then there's a lot of undersampling of all this time variable signal. You only have 16 revolutions, about 16 revolutions per, per day. And at the same time, the Earth is, is, is doing like this. Uh, and you have a bad signal to noise ratio uh, because yeah, this is an unreadable graphic. Uh, geologists like to think in terms of, of, of spherical harmonics. So you have a spherical harmonic degree here at this axis. But please read this as, as, as if it were a simple Fourier power spectrum. So large scales, short scales. And here, sort of power on this axis or amplitude. The thick black line is the static gravity field. The gray zone here, that is the time variable, the hyd especially the hydrological time variations. So you see there's three orders of magnitude at least between static gravity field and, and time variable gravity field. So we're really talking about tiny, tiny signals that you want to measure from 450 kilometers up. So that's, that's one issue. So signals are small and errors are big. Uh, and that means that you really have to find optimal filters, and that is really an art right now in, in, in grace processing, how to find filters. So here again, the blue is, is signal, red is error spectrum, and here they are doing something funny. And that the blue goes up here cannot be physical. Uh, hydrology uh, would never do that. Hydrology or any, any natural signal would go down like a power law, perhaps. So something is going on, and, and filtering is a big issue. Uh, especially how to filter out these, these north-south stripes that you saw in the animation. Now, what it does mean is that GRACE has a limited spatial resolution. The time resolution anyways is one month or perhaps a bit better, but let's say one month. Space resolution is only perhaps a few hundred kilometers, four or five hundred kilometers. So here I have the biggest catchments that can be monitored more or less uh, good by, by GRACE. So again, the fact that it's an integral mass signal is, is of course, a very nice um, uh, property. At the same time, you must do something about separation then, spatial resolution, set for 100 kilometers monthly, and so on and so on. And one of the big comments against this is the comment that we get from hydrologists, well, I, I need a geodesist in my project. And that's not what I want. Perhaps you, you geologists are nice people, but we don't want you in our project, or not all, in all projects. Uh, so we have to do, this must become more operational, and it will become more operational over the next years, I'm sure. So, GRACE will be in orbit for a few more years, uh, but not very long, probably. Uh, there is a growing interest from different geoscience communities, among them also hydrology. But there is no secured follow-on mission right now. That's the trouble. So there is a GRACE follow-on mission planned, perhaps launch in 2016-17, but not 100% sure. GRACE is also high on the agenda with NASA, but yeah, it's all a very delicate business right now. Uh, we really have to compete with other missions, and these missions are, of course, not cheap. Uh, we must be clear about that. So if I have to look into the near future, the short term, uh, it's pretty s safe to predict that, that it can, we, that this can be done, uh, that, that we can improve on GRACE. GRACE provides currently about this level in terms of spatial resolution on this axis and accuracy on this axis. So everything here can be visible for GRACE. If we move this, this yellow curve to the right and, and below, that's something that, that, that is safely to predict that, that can be done in a, in a follow-on mission with more or less current technology. So that's not a big visionary thing to say. Time scale perhaps a little bit improved, the accuracy a little bit improved. That certainly can be done on the short term. One way of doing this is, is having different type of configuration, not flying simply one after each other, but try to separate the two orbits a little bit so that you get a little bit of, of, of cross-track information also in your, in your ranging signal. That, that improves the gravitational signal and therefore you can improve the gravity fields that you determine from it. Um, we would use a lot of GRACE heritage, more or less a copy of, of GRACE, but a little bit improved, perhaps uh, laser SST on board, and we can improve the errors for sure. Um, on the longer term, yeah, we have to move to laser SST, perhaps laser gradiometry. Uh, we have to use perhaps frequency combs, optical clocks, 
and atomic inference. And, and that is, of course, not something for the short term. Before this works, I think 20 years uh, are passed already. Uh, atomic inference is uh, hotly uh, uh, developed right now, but, but still of no use for, for, for gravity missions. There we have to work on that for at least 20, 30 years, perhaps. Information flying would be a good thing, like uh, the, this effect that I mentioned. And the, the key thing, a lot of these errors simply come from undersampling. And what do you do against undersampling? Well, you need to sample better, which means for this case, you need more satellites in space. You need multiple pair uh, configurations. And, and ESA and NASA are thinking about this. They are talking about doing multiple grace type missions, let's say. And perhaps China will chip in. They have an ambitious space program. Could look like this. Uh, different types of orbits, different types of ground tracks. And, well, I get to the conclusion now, and I don't have a slide with conclusions or so. I uh, asked myself the question, was this visionary enough? And I, I'm afraid it was not. Uh, uh, I'm an engineer after all, and I, I can see what happens right now. I can see that it is exciting for many, many communities. Um, and I can also foresee what the, the next 10 years will bring. I also see what is necessary in terms of technology for the next 20, 30 years, but we're far away from that right now. So my vision or my hope uh, would be that we have something like this, an A-train, that you hydrologists um, uh, will know about, but then perhaps for geodesy. So at least uh, swath uh, altimetry, inter, I didn't even talk about these things. There are other geodetic things that could be interesting. But certainly satellite gravimetry uh, for the future of geodesy, but also of hydrology. Thank you very much. Paul Hauser. Most people here have probably heard of Paul Hauser one way or another. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Arizona. Until 2005, he was the head of the Hydrological Sciences Branch in NASA, Goddard. Um, he's also been the director of the CREW, Center for Research in, on Environment and Water in Maryland, Calverton. Um, and now he's a faculty member at the Department of uh, Atmospheric, Oceanic and Earth Sciences of uh, George Mason University in uh, Virginia. So Paul will give us an explanation on a vision for ultra-high resolution integrated water cycle observation and prediction systems. Paul. Thank you, Val. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of vision and dreaming. Um, I have a, a four-part talk. I'm first going to lay a groundwork of uh, why we're doing this for global water cycle research, and then um, lay out a, a vision for a water cycle uh, mission uh, hyper-resolution land modeling of the future, and then advanced integration of those. So first, let's uh, look at the, frame, the, the groundwork. Whenever you're dreaming, you want to make sure you're dreaming about the right thing. So um, let's talk about the, the water and energy cycle. So first of all, the water, water exists in all three phases of the climate system, and the phase transitions um, regulate global and uh, regional energy balances. So that's why sometimes I often will combine uh, energy and water cycle. Water vapor in the atmosphere is the principal greenhouse gas. So when we have increases in water vapor caused by warming, we need to understand how it can be both a positive and negative feedback on the climate system by having more clouds, but also having more greenhouse gas. Um, water is the ultimate solvent, so it um, interacts with biogeochemical and element cycles. And really, most importantly, water mostly is, is the uh, directly impacts and constrains human society and its well-being. So we know the water cycle is changing along with climate change. These are predictions into the future of a surface temperature of various IPCC models from the AR4 showing um, um, some agreement of increase in temperature. But if you look at precipitation increases, because we would expect a warmer atmosphere to hold more water vapor and therefore have more evaporation and precipitation, we get um, much less agreement between the models. But the models do generally say dry regions will get drier and wet regions will get wetter, which isn't great news for any of those people that are getting wetter or drier. 
And here's some evidence that things are actually happening. There are a number of places in the world, uh, Africa and the Middle East, that are getting drier. Precipitation records are showing that. And uh, increases in places like the Northern Hemisphere and uh, South America. So we also know water is rather important. Um, here's a, and it's going to be changing. So this is a 100-year uh, projected water change of uh, fresh water availability, mostly for, for river flow. Um, in the, uh, the red places that are decreasing and blue increasing. So we see uh, places like this, stream flow is decreasing, causing hydropower decreases. We see uh, large decreases in recharge. Um, we see increased flooding in some places and increased pollution. So going on this dream quest, we need to, again, now that we know kind of why we're doing it, next we need to make sure we're dreaming about things that are reasonable. So um, we want to, when we're doing science um, for society, uh, we want to do science for science sake, but we also want to do something that makes a difference. We um, tend to do an engineering approach and combine a bunch of different things together. So we put satellites together, we combine them with models, and we hope that they have some impact on end uses. So when you see the rest of my talk, you'll have to ask yourself the question, if I'm uh, really linking these things together, but also ask another question. So um, in, the, in the US recently, and where I live in Washington, DC, there's been a lot of rules about um, using your cell phone in your car. So people are getting very creative about getting, uh, where did that go away? OK. People are getting very creative about um, uh, using different devices to uh, be able to still talk in the car. But how complicated do these really need to be? Um, there are simple solutions that we can adopt um, that will allow us to reach the same objective. So I'm asking. All these complicated things I'm going to be telling you about, is it really necessary to answer the question? And I'm not sure it always is, but it's good to keep in mind that there are practical solutions to difficult problems. OK, so let's look at some research questions. So for the water cycle, we're concerned about why the water cycle varies. Um, are those variations predictable and how they're linked to other things like nutrient cycles? So we tend to look at this, as, this research topic as a progression from observations to modeling the prediction and then to some end use solution. Um, that tends, tends to be how things go. Things are motivated by observations. We want to predict things so that people who need to make decisions can use those predictions uh, with reasonable confidence. There's lots of different parts to the energy and water cycle. Um, these are just some variables that I've written down um, that are either state variables or feedbacks. Um, I've got the water cycle variables in blue. Red is the uh, energy cycle variables, and green are, um, are uh, carbon-related variables. Black are just boundary conditions. So when we get all these together, you can see there's a large number of earth science um, variables that have to be come into play when you're studying the energy and water cycle. And of course, when, once we get measurements of these or have models uh, that link these together, we can um, uh, do energy and water balance very simply and then create um, models that uh, link those together. Um, Multi-scale information. So what, when we're looking into the future, what kinds of scales do we really need to worry about for, um, for hydrology, for example, or water cycle? Well, we have a variety of scales. We have topography-induced scales down to one meter. We have land cover, vegetation types of scales um, at 100 meter. And we have precipitation-induced or weather scale uh, from 1 to 100 kilometers. So really, the total variability is taken up uh, by this somewhere between 1, and, uh, one meter and 100 kilometers. Often we are, are, these days in hydrology, looking at this 1 8th degree scale, um, about uh, 10 to 12 kilometer resolution. Um, as a, a high-resolution global land grid that we've been uh, using. But if you look at one of these grids, you can see that the variability is still quite extensive within even a 1 8th degree cell. Um, when we look at water cycle prediction components, uh, modeling, observation, and, and solutions, um, we see observations at the center kind of motivating everything from improving understanding to uh, validating um, models and building models uh, supporting predictions, and eventually allowing us to get to those end-use uh, decision tools. 
So let's uh, see what kind of observations we, we have and what we can um, use to observe the water cycle. So here's your electromagnetic spectrum, various different things. Um, can be sensed in this. You can see vegetation, radiation, and snow in the visible. Um, you also turns out you can see a lot of things in the microwave with, um, with remote sensing. So soil moisture, snow, water vapor, um, uh, even the altimetry and uh, um, precipitation kinds of things would be in the microwave sensors. So um, there's really three different kinds of microwave sensors. There's radiometers that just measure emission. There's radars, like altimeters and scatterometers, that measure elevation or backscatter. And then there's imaging radars um, that use uh, synthetic aperture arrays to map variations or produce maps of uh, high resolution radar backscatter at the surface. Um, we already saw an image of the A-Train in the last talk that was very nice. Um, the A-Train has a number of uh, satellites in it that have um, microwave sensors on them. I've listed a few here. There's a few other that are, that are uh, relevant here. I just want to let you know that each one of those is kind of independent resolution, independent location. But we do have, not necessarily by planning, but more by happenstance, we have a bunch of satellites that are kind of following each other right now in, um, in this, uh, this A-Train. So the future I see of a, a possible water cycle mission is instead of having all those microwave sensors all scattered about, even within one uh, chain of satellites, possibly trying to put those all in one satellite. So you could measure all of those different variables at the same time uh, and from the same location, possibly even at the same resolutions, um, using the, um, the microwave uh, sensing ability of the water molecule, you could actually measure um, everything from groundwater, soil moisture, freeze thaw, rain, snow, ice, water vapor, um, lakes and rivers, and perhaps even evaporation by using uh, different frequencies and active and passive um, components of microwave radiation. So here's the, the vision for a water cycle mission. So um, I've already talked about water microwave radiation is good at sensing the water cycle. Um, there's, so there's this potential of a high-resolution, active-passive, multi-frequency uh, mi microwave mission that can make simultaneous observations of almost every critical water cycle process uh, and bring water cycle science to a new compelling level. This mission could be built around a single, elegant, highly integrated, large aperture, multi-frequency, active-passive microwave antenna that could be deployed in, in geostationary or as part of a polar orbiting constellation like GPM is. This could even be thought of as maybe a GPM follow-on. Um, if we want to achieve this goal, we actually have to, we can use our existing sensors to do OSSEs or studies of how we can do a, a multi-frequency retrievals from our existing observations, um, development of robust microwave radio transfer algorithms, and um, understand and develop mission concepts. So we have, these are what, some examples of what this mission might look like. It might be a, a mission that it looks like a large SMOS, or um, it might be a, a large uh, dish antenna deployed in, um, in space, and these are structures that are possible. Um, but microwave requires uh, fairly large antennas, especially at the resolutions that we want to achieve, down to uh, kilometers, even even meters in some cases. Um, here's the, the way we could go forward right now. We could use that A-train or measurements like that to uh, do a, a, a series of parallel linked radio transfer forward models where we use an existing um, constellation of satellites to do an inversion with a uh, model or energy and water balance conservation system to, um, to uh, optimize the, these estimates using parallel linked models um, in order for us to um, uh, progress from the single variable type of instruments we have now to um, multivariable integrated instruments. There's also the possibility of doing this with a sensor web. So I should make sure that's uh, uh, not um, excluded. I am proposing uh, a large, a new large uh, space-based observatory in the last few slides, but it's possible to do that with an A-train kind of system as long as there's tight coupling between the observations, um, a, a way to, uh, to really manage, say in uh, the last few talks, how you, you deploy and optimize those um, resources, um, but also allow for this uh, 
integration of different, uh, uh, different frequencies and active and passive kinds of observations. So you can retrieve all of the signal out of the, the system rather than treating for a single variable, you treat everything as noise. Okay, let's move on to modeling. Um, so we typically divide the world up into grid squares for our, uh, our, our different uh, environmental science modeling. And each of those grid squares has innately inside of it some high variability that we eventually want to try and capture in the models. Um, there's a couple of ways to do this. The first way is just a conventional approach, make the modeling grid boxes smaller. And we, we have been doing that. Um, but it, it looks like it may take up to 50 years for us to be able to get these down to the, the sub-kilometer kinds of scales that we want to get globally in both climate and uh, weather prediction. Um, there is a possibility for breakthrough approaches by simulating a sample or doing statistical subgrid scale um, uh, information at high resolutions within each grid box, and that might be a, a shortcut to give us about a 10 year, two years to implement uh, models that can actually, on the global scale, capture these high resolution dynamics. Now, I'm going to um, depart from the water cycle and talk about land surface. Uh, modeling specifically, um, that's my, my area of expertise and I want to uh, focus on that for the next uh, little part of this talk. So um, terrestrial hydro hydrological cycle has many coupled processes, weather generating processes, water resources, biogeochemical bio cycles, for example, and all the other words you see on here of, of water transfer between different parts of that system. The way we do modeling now, we typically divide the world up into smaller boxes where we have, say, a groundwater model separated from a lake or river model, separated from uh, an atmospheric model. And we kind of do all those different things separately. And that's not actually how the real world works. It actually um, works much more coupled tightly where things that happen in the land surface model directly impact, say, the uh, atmospheric model through um, uh, differences in temperature or moisture causing uh, sea breezes or um, small-scale lateral movement that when you just couple them vertically are lost. So the future of hyper-resolution land modeling um, uh, is uh, outlaid here. So there's uh, some land modeling grand challenges. First is to deal with the uh, surface-subsurface dynamics, the stream-groundwater interaction, including river networks and whatnot, to understand to really get into these models in a coupled way, how the, the, how the, um, the surface soil interacts with uh, um, the deeper groundwater uh, systems rather than treating those as two different models. Um, there's a the land atmosphere interactions, the small scale lateral feedbacks I talked about. Uh, small, um, abrupt changes or discontinuities in the land surface can actually cause uh, small breezes that occur sideways or horizontally that should be included in these systems. Uh, water quality, uh, nutrient transport, CO2 and pollution, uh, things that involve uh, ecology but also people should be put in there. And of course human impacts may be one of the largest grand challenges. How do we get into these systems, um, dams, uh, water management, irrigation, uh, water storage, urbanization, um, diversions, changes in land, management of land systems, so that those, those are actively included in the modeling system. Computational considerations, land data simulation, and obs using observations in these models are going to be a critical, important component. Um, and uh, the goal is to progress towards a fully process scale resolving model of the land surface hydrology, atmospheric dynamics, and cloud processes over the global domain. So this is just an example um, of the kinds of resolutions we're talking about. As you divide the world up into smaller and smaller pieces, you see the complexity continues to remain high, even at high resolutions. And that high, co high complexity can be important not only for local applications, but also for um, implications for how it affects global uh, weather and climate patterns. One example of this kind of model has been put forward by the um, uh, community uh, land model at NCAR version four. It has um, a number of these different kinds of components in it. You can see them listed here. They're still listed as, as separate components that are linked together. 
But um, you can see the kinds of things that are getting included in these models, carbon cycle, hydrology and rivers, ice sheets, urbanization, vegetation dynamics, actually being able to grow vegetation, and that kind of thing. Okay, um, the, towards the end of, of the talk, I'm gonna talk now about data assimilation, and there's lots of things that I could talk about in terms of the, uh, the theory of data integration, the ways that we integrate data, but what I wanna do is actually talk about my morning commute, and I actually do um, data, commute, um, data assimilation every morning on my drive into work, so, um, you know, I'm kind of, uh, groggy, so I just close my eyes for a few minutes while I'm driving, and I wake up, and I get an observation. And I make a correction to my trajectory of my car, and then I close my eyes for another 10 seconds or so, and oh, I can make another correction when I get the next, next observation. And that's really what we're doing with the, the land model. I'm joking, by the way, that's not how I, how I commit to work. Um, but, but really what we're doing is finding ways to, uh, to incorporate the real world into the model. How do we um, take those uh, little glimpses of reality we get from the satellites or from ground sensors, how do we bring those into the model to kind of get it back on course? Because the model has assumptions in it that to make it um, uh, stray from reality. So here's an example from um, actually my dissertation a long time ago um, of what data simulation can do. So given an observation, and a model first guess, the model is, in this case, a little bit too dry, and so we can combine those together with data simulation methods, and we can get an end result. And what this shows is that you can not only get rid of some errors, like here's Tombstone, Arizona, this is the place where the, um, the gunfighters had a little fight a few hundred years ago. They, um, they have houses with tin roofs on them and whatnot that the remote sensing device doesn't really see through, and the model treats that, or this data simulation method, treats that as a, an error. And you can see it doesn't come through in the final product. But the other thing that can happen is you can actually expand the usefulness of the observations. You can spread them out. So the observation corrects not only the area where we observed, it, it corrects the entire model domain using statistical correlations. We've done this uh, since then with a lot of different kinds of uh, data and models. Um, and uh, methods. So I've done soil moisture assimilation, snow cover, and snow water assimilation, as well as skin temperature assimilation, and a few others I've worked with students on, like assimilating stream flow. Um, and then also developed uh, some theories of uh, eventually we've come, come in the community to, to really adopting some kind of ensemble-based uh, filtering system because the models are so nonlinear that uh, that's, that's been the most successful. So what's the future of this? If we, we dream a little bit, what's the, the best kind of data simulation we see happening? Um, we see some algorithm development. So uh, push for, for algorithms, filters that are independent of the model. Some models require the development of adjoints. Um, and every time you change your model, you have to re-derive the adjoint of it. So if we can find ways like ensemble methods that are independent, that's great. Um, radiance assimilation, we can actually assimilate um, data directly from the satellite rather than using them, um, uh, using some uh, uh, retrieved me um, measurement. We can also link calibration and assimilation. So hydrological models are famous for needing to be calibrated. So um, you uh, use an optimal search routine to find where the best uh, parameters are for a given situation. And um, that's closely linked to the bias of that model. Well, for assimilation, we need an unbiased uh, estimate. So if we can link calibration to reduce the bias and assimilation to assimilate the time varying error, um, or reduce the time error, error, then we can, uh, we can get a model that really learns from the observations. Um, and also understand the potential for uh, data assimilation downscaling. We need um, better land models. I already talked about some of that using advanced processes. Um, and uh, better, we need states that look more like the observations. Um, we need to assimilate new types of data. For instance, this uh, water cycle mission that I talked about or just basically stream flow, vegetation dynamics, um, gravity water uh, change through, uh, or groundwater change through gravity. Um, boundary layer structures actually go up into the atmosphere and assimilate the boundary layer without a transpiration. And of course, um, uh, use OSSEs for optimizing future system planning with all this whole thing. 
um, and, then, and then finally, understanding how the land surface interacts with the atmosphere through coupled feedbacks. Um, there's been some progress on pieces of this, so the land information system uh, that I started developing uh, 10 years ago, it's still under development at NASA, um, took uh, what was then about a 25 kilometer resolution global model and brought it down to one kilometer. You can see um, uh, quite a, a bit of resolution. That resolution really gives you a lot of fidelity. In fact, I think I can see Eric Wood's house there. Uh, this system has also been coupled with um, an atmospheric model, the, the weather research and forecasting model. Um, and given improved um, surface conditions, uh, we can also improve the land atmosphere interaction. So this is observed rainfall for, uh, uh, I think it's the Midwest United States. This is um, the atmospheric model without this cup tight coupling with the land information system. And with it, we, we get a much better simulation of precipitation from that, um, from that system. So these ideas, modeling and assimilation ideas, have been implemented at the global scale for quite a long time. This is some examples of uh, data from the global scale modeling system. And they've resulted also in, uh, in this kind of result where we see um, if we use, this is an op observed uh, pre precipitation anomaly for the United States. This is a predicted atmospheric only model uh, prediction of that anomaly, so it didn't do so well. But if we use um, uh, the scaled GLDAS, Global Land Data Assimilation System uh, input, you can see it gets the anomaly much more precisely. So there's a bunch of different um, global projects all over the world that are developing um, local land data assimilation systems, models, and observation systems that are being deployed um, regionally. So I mentioned the GLDAS. There's also a, a very mature NLDAS, um, North American Land Data Simulation System. This is one of the products from there. There's um, an Arab Land Data Simulation System. Uh, this is a picture from the European uh, land data simulation system, and there's a whole bunch of others. Um, I know I haven't listed them all, but it gives me an idea. So another vision is that we could put all of these land modeling systems together. So if we cooperated internationally, we could actually, um, say, go back to that, um, that global LDAS picture. So instead of just using one model here and one observation data set that I can get globally, we could incorporate all of this information and patch together um, the best available local information for a global picture of the terrestrial hydrology. And that brings me to my last slide. So my vision for the future, ultra high resolution integrated water cycle observation and prediction system, integrating together this hyperspectral microwave water cycle sensor or smart sensor webs, um, ultra high resolution, high performance, uh, prediction systems like the, the uh, land information system, advanced data assimilation and calibration systems, and then also we can't forget the decision support tools at the end, the reason we're doing this all. Are we really doing something that um, has the right, are we using the right tools to answer the questions? Well, that probably depends on what the questions are, but if the questions are how is the water cycle changing and can we predict it, we really need to advance beyond our current capacity. Uh, of uh, prediction in order to answer those questions. Thank you. Yes, this one works. Uh, as I only have a few minutes, uh, and we have maybe eight minutes, 
a short panel discussion. It's not going to be a discussion. It's more a couple of statements on uh, what constitutes the ideal water cycle observation system. Um, the idea is to have the panel members, uh, each one of them have one minute to comment on that statement, and then we have a few minutes uh, to have some comments, not questions, comments from the uh, audience uh, on that. I'd like to start with uh, Patrick uh, to comment on uh, that. So I think the last talk captured a lot of the broader picture. Uh, going from the hyper-resolution, the data assimilation, all the way down to the decision support, I think to really justify the level of economic investment, um, it's important, and that's one of the themes in my talk, is to bridge actually the fields that are involved in this uh, and create an observing system that actually has active feedbacks where the information just doesn't come down from the observation system, but both the terrestrial, the landscape system, so the ground observations as well as the satellite observations are able to feed into an information availability that people have that access and the tools necessarily to use that information, but also to send signals to the evolution of the observation system itself. So in the end, you have to have that feedback between prediction and observation. So I think that's my ideal for the future. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, Nico. All right, I can uh, only, of course, uh, look at uh, this broader picture through my geodetic glasses. Uh, um, I have one main concern. Uh, I told you about the Gray satellite mission that is uh, nearly at the end of its lifetime. Uh, it, it can die out any day now. Uh, and, and there is not a mission in sight which follow on, follows on quickly. There will be a gap. And I think that's disastrous, especially in climate science where you want to build up long time series. Um, so uh, my, my ideal would be, of course, my, my, my strategy would be to have a, a gravity field mission as a long-term monitoring mission, ideally an ESA GMS program or something like that. Uh, but to get, to get there, we need a lot of support from the neighboring communities, uh, for instance, the hydrology community. So I think we, we need a better communication between geodesy and hydrology any, anyway. Uh, that means that, that also hydrologists perhaps need to know the, the nitty and gritty stuff of, of, of this type of data processing. Uh, the other way around, geodesists must be aware of the real needs uh, of, of the hydrological uh, community. So I think there's a lot more discussion, uh, uh, a lot more discussion will be needed and hopefully we can uh, reach this future where, where we have uh, well, a new gravity field mission flying perhaps 2016, uh, a next generation perhaps 2020, 2025. Thank you very much, Nika. Okay, Paul, may I ask you to comment as well? Okay, ultimately, what we're trying to do here is, is develop um, systems that improve prediction, enable us to do better science, and do decision support um, improvement. But I want to point out that what we have in my presentation that, that is probably a, the biggest grand challenge is this idea of a large water cycle mission that's hyperspectral, active, passive. And I don't want to um, scare you, but this is a very large, expensive mission. If we're going to do something like this, it has to be pushed for, you know, sooner than later, because the tendency is not to do this kind of mission in the future. Um, I had this go through a, a, um, a business panel or a, you know, kind of a, a, a group of engineers at NASA considered this, and one of them at the end <laughs> called it, we're going to launch Battlestar Galactica. So, if you know what that is, very, very large structure in space. So um, it's, uh, if we want to do something like that, we have to actually organize as a community to make it happen. Thank you very much, Paul. And then two uh, prominent other people. I'll start with Alberto and ask him for a comment. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to say a few words. I didn't have the opportunity to attend all the session, but I'm very pleased to take this opportunity to say my opinion because I am an outsider in this field, I am a surface hydrologist, and being a surface hydrologist, I am very much excited by the opportunity to use remotely sensitive observations in hydrological studies, and in particular, I am excited by the opportunity to use water levels, remotely sensitive water levels, integrated in my studies of rainfall and of modeling. So I think this is really an exciting avenue, research avenue for the future, and I am very much motivated to do my best to promote a better integration 
in the hydrological community of the remote sensing community. We are already integrated, but I'm really convinced that we have already now a lot of opportunities for taking profit from the remotely sensed observation in hydrology. And I think we really have to start already now to, to ask ourselves, how can we make a better use of what you are already uh, producing of uh, your researches. I think, again, this is really an interesting opportunity. Thank you very much. And then last but not least, uh, Gerrit, uh, please. Uh. Um, I'm like Alberto, an outsider in this field. I'm a sort of physicist, and I'm the guy that's going to spoil the fun a little bit. Um, we've organized a session here on water cycle observations and what struck me most, hydrological water cycle observation, what struck me most in this session is that there wasn't a single flux observed. They're all state variables uh, at various scales, but no real fluxes. And what we need is fluxes. We need evapotranspiration fluxes, preferably evapo trans evaporation separated from transpiration, Transpiration being the flux that makes ecosystems productive and for long-term potable water storage understanding we really need the flux from the unsaturated zone to the groundwater. That's the water that we're going to drink uh, in the future decades. So if there is any possibility to develop sensing systems uh, that can observe fluxes instead of states, that would be my dream. I'm not going to say keep on dreaming, um, but uh, yes, that's a very good point. Um, now I have uh, two minutes left. Uh, is there anybody in the audience who'd like to add his or her comment? <clears throat> Hello, I, I would like to add that, uh, I mean, I think also is a, a critical, important, and are being recognized by the space agencies. But I think the one thing that is important, there should be collaboration between people who know a lot about OSSEs, like the operational centers, and also the research community. Neither can do everything. So I, I would not, uh, unless I got it wrong, neither of the speakers said that, but they spoke about integration, but I think an important thing is to make sure that you talk to the people who know what they're doing. And one of the things is to have, a, 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 in my view, stronger interaction between the operational and the research communities, and you will get a better uh, description of the observing system that way. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who has a desire to? Yes, there you go. Yes, I've heard here a very um, exhaustive and comprehensive point of view from the water cycle, but it's very important to show the connection with all the measurables. And I would say, for instance, the vegetation, biodiversity, so that you show that what you are measuring is also relevant for other communities that may be sharing some of your observing systems. Right. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to conclude the session and thanking all the speakers uh, for their uh, contributions. Thank you very much.